Today's Around the Schools program on the Wellington Caves is somewhat different in that it was produced with the assistance of talented students in years 8, 9 and 10 from high schools and central schools in Wellington and Dubbo districts. These students were selected to attend a special camp at Wellington Caves because of their interest in environmental matters and their talents in producing educational resource materials. These materials will be developed into valuable resources for use by both schools and the general public when they're visiting the Wellington Caves. To prepare for the camp, a special advisory and management committee was set up comprising members of Wellington Shire Council and the Department of Education. This committee arranged for a number of experts and advisers on caves to be in attendance during the camp. We'll be meeting some of these people in the interviews the students conducted for this video. A special highlight of the week's activity at Wellington Caves was that it coincided with the rediscovery of the historic water cave. Students were also fortunate to be permitted to explore the famous Bone Cave, an area not open to the general public, but of great scientific importance. Anyway, as mentioned before, this is a student's production, so let's hear the story from them. We're at the Wellington Caves. We're doing an educational thing to promote them for tourists and students that will be coming to visit the caves. We're standing next to the Diprotodon. It was around, thankfully, 16,000 years ago. It was a herbivore, that means a grass-eating animal, and it's, this is its full size. We're going to be showing you different things like inside the bone cave where the Diprotodon bones were found. We're going to be going to the Cathedral Cave which has the big stalactite and stalactite. So why don't you come and join us? Come on. Let's go. Yeah. Before you go into a cave you need some of the necessary items of equipment such as the helmet and the powerful light. It's a good idea to um, wear old clothes such as these overalls to protect um, your other clothes from getting really dirty because it is quite grubby in the caves and shoes with good grip are also helpful. This lamp is pretty handy, it connects to the hat and it's run by a battery which lasts for about 12 hours. It's convenient to carry around the cave because it's small and you can use your hands for climbing and that. The helmet's a hard top, you'll appreciate the helmet just in case you hit your head on the rocks. Planning for the, uh, the Wellington Caves week actually started uh, uh, almost six months ago with the formation of the Wellington Caves Management Committee and uh, I guess the culmination of the Management Committee's program was to produce an educational package for the, the Wellington Caves to, uh, to work on something which we could, we could say has been a, a very underutilised uh, resource in the Central West. We have quite a number of tourists and school children who come through this, uh, this resource each year and uh, we're now planning to, to make it more open and uh, a lot more of a knowledge content for them uh, during their stay here. I guess in environmental education we have, the, we have a slogan that, uh, that says that knowledge leads to understanding and, and understanding leads to, to action. I would say that if, with taking the, the students we have this week and the program we've put them through, with having a number of uh, authorities and, and, uh, in the fields of cave management, of um, fossil identification, of speleology, uh, and cave formation, of course, and get, imparting this knowledge to the students, they certainly have a better understanding. And if we can then, in turn, impart this knowledge to the tourists and students who visit here in the future, well, I think we've really achieved something. Andy Spate, what is your interest in the caves? I have been interested in caves for years and years and years. Uh, first of all, from a sort of recreational sporting, sporting point of view. And in recent times, I'm very much interested in their formation, how old they are, the things that they're in them, that are in them, and how to manage them so we've got them around for future people to look at, uh, and so we don't uh, make them up too quickly. What's unique about the landscapes around Wellington Caves? Well, strictly speaking, the landscapes aren't unique, which is an unusual thing in Australia to find caves and the associated uh, hills and, and, and minor solution cast features so-called that we've got, we've got here. Um, and there are other things important about the, uh, the caves here. Can you explain what a cast landscape is? Yes, this is a, a technical term that scientists use all the time to confuse people, unfortunately. Cast landscapes are a particular sort of landscape 
produced by chemical action rather than physical wearing away that produces most of the landscapes we know. How are caves formed? This is a fairly difficult and complicated question. In simplest form, we have water moving down through a rock mass. Uh, it dissolves away the limestone. This is the chemical action I talked about earlier. It enlarges the joints until rivers form, or small streams form, which gradually dissolve away the limestone, make bigger and bigger caves. If these get too big for the rock structure that we're standing in, uh, we might have collapse and lead to very large caves indeed. The discovery of the water cave has been absolutely unbelievable. It wouldn't have been done without two of the people involved here on the week being able to be here, Ernie Holland and Armstrong Osborne, and for the students to actually have seen that and to have been here while the excavation was done and then to see these people going into the cave and then to see some of the photos that have come out from inside. That is something that they'll always remember and I know all the staff involved here will remember as well. Before midday, council workers had revealed the opening, ending a 10-year search for the elusive cave. Inside, the V-shaped ceiling confirmed this was the right cave. The anticline, one of the few to be seen anywhere in the world. Working with Dr Armstrong at the cathedral cave in front of the altar. Dr Armstrong, in your opinion, how did the altar form? Well, the altar is rather interesting because it's supposed to be the world's largest stalagmite, but if we look at it, we see it's actually made of flowstone. So it's been produced by sheets of water coming down from the roof and depositing calcite as they flow down. Now, it was long thought that the altar had acted like a dam, that all this mud that makes up the floor here had dammed back behind the altar, and that the altar extended some 10 to 15 metres down under the ground. When the excavation was put in the floor just over there by Dr Mike Orgy to look for fossil bones, no trace was found at any depth of the altar formation. And the mud layers in there were found to slope not towards the altar, as would be expected if the mud had come in through the entrance of the cave, but away from the altar. This makes it very likely that the altar is a coating over a large pile of mud and rubble that came through a hole in the roof. The altar then is probably a fairly young feature of the cave, not an old one as had been previously thought, and it may have a big mud and rock core inside it. We really don't know because nobody's drilled a hole into it to find out, but it's most likely a big mass of flowstone over a pile of rock and mud. Did this cave form differently from others because one wall is different from the other? Well the walls are, are much much older than the cave of course. What we're seeing in the walls is the difference between two types of rock. The wall over that side of the cave which is this plain grey white coloured rock is what's called massive limestone. It's limestone which has very few original layers in it and is largely made of fairly clean lime mud. The other side of the cave is made of what we call thinly bedded limestone. And you can see in it a whole range of layers. They're being bent in various places. And this sort of limestone was laid down at times when there were changes in the rate of the lime mud being deposited. And so each of these layers represents a break in the depositing of the mud. Now if we look at that wall we can see it has these extraordinary twisted shapes in it. The rock here has been bent and it's been bent quite dramatically. Now this sort of bending can either be caused by the rock being squashed due to major earth movements or by the rock sliding when it was still quite wet and twisting as it slides down say the edge of an island or off the continental shelf. The tight nature of these bends or what we call folds in the rock and their shape in some places they actually bend over the top of themselves suggests perhaps that it might have been produced by the lime mud sliding down a slope while it was still wet. Now the importance about this to the cave is if we look at this big cave here it's formed at the junction at the boundary between this 
grey, thinly bedded limestone on this side and this lighter coloured massive limestone on this side. And that gives us a clue to how the cave formed. The junction between the two types of rock is a place where water can get in. So water coming in along the junction is able to expand, dissolve away the rock and begin to produce a cavern. So that's how the rock started to be dissolved to form the cave. What's unusual about this cave is the shape of the walls. If we look at the shapes of the walls, we see particularly over on this side where it's not disturbed by the layers, that there are these little curved depressions in the wall. And that suggests that this cave was dissolved by fairly still water, a big pond of water in which the water moved in little eddies, little bits of the water moved around and it eroded away or dissolved away the sides of the walls, both in the roof and in the sides and probably, of course, in the floor down here. We don't know what's under this floor or really how deep the cave is here. So this is an enormous chamber. It's not produced by fast flowing water. It's produced by a big pond of still water dissolving away the rock. Is this the natural floor of the cave? Well, that's a very interesting question because for a long time we thought that this hummocky floor here was the natural floor of a cave, that this was in fact how the floor of a cave had always looked. This was a bit confusing because also we knew that when Major Mitchell came into this cave in 1830, one of the people who was with him sunk up to his waist in a fine white dust that was somewhere in the area near the altar. So that made us suspect that there was something different about the surface of the floor here now to what it was in the past. When the excavation was dug through the floor, it was found that the first metre or so of earth was in fact not natural. It contained bits of records, all sorts of junk. So apparently the upper metre of this floor has been disturbed by European people, but below that it is natural and extends down say 10 or 15 metres. The humpy effect on the floor, which we thought was some very special natural process, apparently is produced by people walking over the mud and by little rocks in the mud actually resisting the tread of people's feet. So apparently if you've got mud with pebbles in it and you have lots of people walking over it, you end up having this humpy floor here. So it's not a spectacular natural feature at all. It's, a, it's an artefact and it's produced by lots of people who come in here on tours milling around on the floor here and compacting the top layer of the earth. Are there any unique features of Cathedral Cave? Well, I think the most important features of Cathedral Cave are just its, its shape, these solution hollows in the wall. This sediment under the floor here in fact contains significant fossils, but they're a long way down. Um, in the 18... 80s, holes were dug in this floor and they went down in their measurements about 40 feet and they found extinct fossil animals in the bottom of these holes. So there's a great thickness of sediment under here. It does contain fossils but it's a long way down and in fact it's very difficult to dig down that far because the earth at that depth becomes quite wet and that's one of the reasons why the excavation over in that corner was abandoned was because the hole was filling up with water. How old is Cathedral Cave, do you know? It's very difficult to say how old a cave is. Uh, there's nothing in here that gives us any good clues as to the age of the cave. It has to be younger, of course, than the limestone, but that means it's younger than, say, 300 million years old. That doesn't tell us very much. It's older than the oldest sediments in the cave, and we know they're probably about 100,000 years old. So from those two things, we don't get any good hold on how old the cave is. The only other clue we can get is how old we think the landscapes around the cave are. And that's very difficult to estimate, but the cave is probably millions of years old. And that's about all that we can really say with any certainty at the moment. Dr Armstrong, how long have you been interested in caves? Well, I, I first got interested in caves in about, I think it was 1971, when I went on a caving trip with the scouts, and 
I got puzzled by the fact that there were all these things in the caves. Nobody seemed to know a great deal about them. And so I'd always been interested in geology, so I went to uni and studied geology, and when I got a chance to do some research, I started trying to understand about how caves filled up with mud, how it happened and what sorts of things there were. As I got more interested, I found out, in fact, people knew very little about the caves in New South Wales. And in 1982, I did 1981 and 82, I did research here at Wellington Caves looking at the cave deposits in the phosphate mine. And after that, I worked for about five years looking at the geological history of caves in New South Wales. And I've been interested in how old caves are and when caves formed in the past, because these limestones have been around for a long, long time and they've been ex exposed on the Earth's surface many times. And I wondered if we could find evidence of caves that had formed many times in the past. And what I found is that not so much at Wellington but many other places we can find evidence that there were caves, say, 200 million years ago, but there were caves 300 million years ago. These have all filled up now. And many of the modern caves follow along the path of the ancient caves. Now, this type of landform, known as a cast landform, is where caves develop. And they develop in a similar process as the landform itself has developed. The dissolving processes have formed the top or the surface, what's known as Karen. And if you look around, you can see all these funny shapes. That's the Karen. And uh, with this Karen, you get solution pipes uh, occurring. The water's dissolving downwards. And when it gets down to lower levels, it's starting to widen out the cracks you can see in the rock. And these cracks then become the caves. And so anything we do up here affects what happens below. For example, over here, see this white rock? And see how that young lady there is lifting that up? Well, there's been burning on this white rock here. They've been burning rubbish and things like that. And that's destroyed the feature that we were looking at a moment ago and causing it all to peel off and everything and break down to dirt. If you look a little bit higher up, you see all that shrubbery out there. That's unnatural to this area. And that being unnatural, will interfere with the processes that are going on as far as cave development underneath. And as we've walked around the place and we've seen buildings and all sorts of things, they all interfere with how the water gets down and how the caves develop. And uh, this is a major concern in land management. Okay, Andy, what's your background in caving? Well, my background uh, in caving is that uh, when I lived out at a place called Grenfell, there was a lot of gold mines and things like that, and I got interested in holes in the ground. And I used to go clambering down all these old mines looking for minerals and things like that. And then uh, around the late 60 periods, there was a bit of an economic change, and I was a farmer. And I, because of my interest in minerals and all that, and because of economic circumstances, I decided to look for something different. And uh, I that stage applied for and got a job with the Tourism Commission of New South Wales and became a guide at Janolan Caves. Now, in the time as a guide, as I mentioned earlier, I became interested in caves, crawling around them, learning all about them. And uh, around about um, in the late 1970s, there had been a development of cave tourism conferences and things like that. And uh, I got interested in that and went to go to the conferences and got very interested in land management. 1984, after being at Janolan for a while, I was appointed as the senior guide at Janolan Caves. And uh, this got me around the country a lot more. We started doing a lot of restoration work at Janolan in the caves itself, and other cave systems got interested and started asking for me advice and things like that. And then uh, last year, we had a cave conference at um, a travelling cave conference and we actually come here to Wellington and went to a lot of other caves moving around the country looking at all sorts of things and from that conference it became realised there was a, a major problem occurring around Australia and New Zealand with cave management in that there was a lot of new techniques being developed and a lot of people becoming aware of the problems but we weren't communicating with each other about all these techniques and so from that, the Australasian Cave Management Association was formed and I was elected as president of that association. Since then, I've been uh, also doing, uh, and before then too, doing some advisory jobs around the country, like at Wellington, I'm on the advisory committee here for the uh, management of the caves. I've been asked to a lot of other cave systems for advice on what to do and things like that. And I've done jobs in other caves area on a contract basis of management problems and identifying problems and suggesting once those problems are identified, who should tackle them. 
and I have a great interest for caves, as you may have noticed in the last few days. See, see all the rubbish down there? This is another problem in cave management. All that rubbish slowly over years dissolves, gets carried down through the caves in the water tub and gets pumped back up and we drink it again. And also this buries caves and there's a possibility there's a cave buried down in there that we're going to have to dig back out and get into one day. I'm talking to Mr Peter Gesling. Peter, could you tell me something about your work? Yes, I'm the Shire Engineer Planner with the Wellington Shire Council and I have uh, responsibility for the long-term planning for, for the caves area as part of my responsibilities in the Shire. Could you tell me something about the plans that Wellington Shire Council has for the caves area? Yes, there's a number of, uh, I suppose, competing interest groups uh, uh, involved at the caves and, uh, and Council is keen to uh, push the potential in each of those areas and they involve uh, scientific, uh, educational, tourism and recreational aspects. Uh, all have a part to play and all need to be balanced in, in terms of preserving the area and developing it. With the discovery of the water cave, um, do you make any plans for opening that up to the public? Yes, we certainly uh, would uh, be seeking to open that up. It would be a matter, though, of, uh, of hastening slowly to make sure we don't damage any of the important formations in there and uh, being able to assess as we go what is important and what isn't. Uh, even some of the rubbish in there is important in trying to date the caves and uh, some of that, no doubt, will be kept as part of an ongoing display in the area. Um, as well as the, the river cave, uh, which the divers uh, uh, found a few weeks ago, and uh, we're still assessing how we might be able to get uh, people in to have a look at that. With the discovery of a new cave, how does that affect the planning of the Wellington Caves? It uh, provides a great potential uh, to, uh, to development in all of the areas that, that I previously mentioned, and uh, it uh, is looked on um, uh, with, with interest by, by the councillors and by the public. It provides a new interest in the area. People who have been here before uh, obviously could be interested in coming back and so it provides enormous potential to, to the future development here. Two days later. There's matches in there. Thank you. Yeah, I'll give you a hand. Let's <laughs> <laughs> go into the room. Right. I think that was like. Yes, I'm right. Don't want to get that. You all made it. What are you? What's it been like exploring this cave, Tim? Oh, it's really quite enjoyable. It's very exciting to be able to see all the different veins throughout the cave. I'd just like to say I'm very glad we've got safety equipment on, because it's very small up there. Our heads keep hitting the rocks. It's very dirty. I'm glad I've got these overalls on, because if I, don't, if I didn't, I don't think I'd have any skin on my elbows or my knees left. We've been in a lot of places where we haven't been before. We've experienced a lot, too. How are these bones deposited in the area? Well, there have been a number of theories about this deposit because it's very unusual. It's unusual to have such a range of bones and it's very unusual to have the bones aligned in layers the way they are in here. The very first people who studied the bones here thought that they were deposited by a flood. In fact, some people thought that it was a result of Noah's flood. And at that stage, that was an important explanation people had. Later on, it was thought that perhaps the sea might have come up and washed them in, but fairly soon it became apparent that those sorts of explanations wouldn't work. One of the early scientists here thought that bad air coming out of the caves poisoned the animals on the ground surface and they fell down into the caves. That also seems highly unlikely. In the 1960s, an American person came into this cave and thought he saw the den of an extinct marsupial carnivore, probably a marsupial lion, that these animals lived in the caves, killed the animals and dragged them in and ate them in here. This was why he thought the bones were broken up. The problem is the range of bones we find in here are not the sort of things you'd expect to find in a carnivore den. It's most likely that these bones were deposited somewhere else in the cave system and washed into here. The combination of very large limestone boulders, like this, in among mud, with horizontal bones is not the normal sort of combination you find in most sediments. If a stream had washed it in, we'd expect them to be sorted out according to the size of the fragments. Probably this material was brought in in some sort of a wet, sloppy slurry, perhaps a mudslide or something like this, and it was deposited 
that way, but it is a difficult deposit to understand how it got here and it continues to puzzle people. The way it's arranged, the range of bones and the sheer number of bones are all puzzles that we still don't have definite answers for. Something fell on my hat, was that the bone cave falling in? Well this is an unsupported cavity so there's no, there's no timbering or shoring to hold the roof up and it's only the strength of this bone material here that is actually supporting the roof. Now fortunately behind all this bone material somewhere there is actually a real cave so if anything falls in it's not going to be the whole thing back to the surface but yes fragments of material can fall out of the ceiling and that's an important safety feature. People really need to be wearing helmets when they come in here and they need to be very careful particularly if they're digging at the rock with chisels or hammers or picks that they don't cave the roof in. So that's another reason why it's not particularly safe for people to come in here who really don't know what they're doing because it would be fairly easy to have an accident in here and with all caves you need to know what you're doing and to have the right equipment if you're going to explore them safely. Looking from these bones, Armstrong, they look as though they're in fragments. Why is that? Well, one of the problems with the deposits at Wellington is they contain bone fragments. Virtually no complete skeletons have ever been found and even very few complete skulls or complete bones have been found. The bones in this deposit, whether they're very big bones or very little bones, are largely smashed up. Now this must have something to do with how the bones got into the cave and we're not exactly sure how that happened. One of the problems this has meant is that many of the animals that were first found here couldn't be reconstructed till similar complete skeletons were found elsewhere. The most important bones that we find in these caves are teeth and fragments of jaws and skulls because from them it's possible to identify what the animal is. A lot of the bone we find here, like these bits and pieces, are just bone fragments and it's almost impossible to work out what sort of an animal these things belong to. So one of the most important jobs in looking at the fossils in this deposit is to actually sort through and identify what is the important material because most of what's here is just a whole mass of fractured bones. I'm speaking with Mr Jeff Strain, the tour guide at Wellington Caves. Um, could you tell me something about your work you do here? Well, I'm, I'm only a part-time guide really. I do uh, other work for Wellington Council, uh, promoting the educational tours. But the main idea of guiding is to ensure that people see the things of interest in the caves and understand the role that the caves play in the tourist industry to encourage people to understand what the formation of the caves uh, means to the entire landscape in the Wellington district. Who seems to enjoy the caves the most? It varies a lot. We can uh, find groups of children having a wonderful time and uh, also adults enjoy themselves if they've got an imagination. They see all sorts of wonderful things in the caves and quite often they find things that I haven't seen myself before, such as uh, unusual formations and uh, uh, shapes and shadows uh, which have an artistic effect within the caves themselves, quite apart from the stalactites and the stalagmites. Have you made any changes in the cave itself? They won't let me make any changes. <laughs> Jeff, can you tell me how long have you been interested in caves? Well, not so much interested as worried. My son took up caving about uh, 15 years ago and he goes down holes that I wouldn't like to see rabbits try and struggle through. And this worried me, but as far as an interest in the actual caves from a tourist point of view is concerned, uh, I've been uh, very interested in the caves since I came to Wellington 10 years ago, but I've only been guiding for about three years now. I would like to introduce Michael Oji. Thank you. Good day. What exactly is your occupation? My occupation is university lecturer. My field of research is fossils. 
Why are the Wellington Caves so well known? Wellington Caves are exceedingly well known, probably throughout the world, at least amongst biologists, primarily because of the incredibly rich fossil beds here and for the fact that they've been known since the very beginning of Australia as a colony. Where have most of the bones been found? Most of the bones have been found in fissure fillings. These are cavities in the limestone that at some time, relatively recently, compared to the deposit of the limestone, have been filled with mud that carries the bones. Unfortunately, most of those fissures are not the ones at the normal tourist caves, uh, where tourist visits are located. How are the bones deposited in the caves? Ah, that's the difficult question. People have been asking that and coming up with imaginative answers for years. We really don't know, and perhaps the main reason we don't know is because we have no model. There's no example anywhere else in the world of a process that has collected bones to this extent. What is so interesting? interesting about all these bones? It's interesting because they show a fauna of mammals that is very, very different from the fauna that is alive today, and yet not that long ago. We've got carbon dates of about 10 to 12,000 years before present, and that's not a very long time, that uh, are associated with deposits of things like diprotodons, which were the largest marsupials that ever lived, thylacoleo, which is the largest carnivorous marsupial that ever lived, in other words, a very different marsupial fauna from that we have today. What do the teeth show about the animals? Teeth show, first of all, diet. So you can easily look at a set of teeth such as these, which are from the Wellington Caves. You can tell by the nature of the ridges, the size, the shape, that this was an animal that ate plants. It was an herbivore. Not only that, they're very sturdy. The ridges are very sharp, so you can tell that this animal probably fed on leaves and twigs. You can tell by the shape and the nature of the teeth that it was a marsupial, very similar to kangaroos. And finally, you can probably identify the very species just from the teeth. How long have people been searching for bones in the Wellington Caves? Well, that's one of the exciting things. These were certainly the first fossil bones known from Australia. Right back in 1830, more than 150 years ago, the first collections were made here and under the auspices of Major Mitchell were sent off to London, Edinburgh, Paris, and very quickly were known throughout Europe. What are the significances of some of the finds in the Wellington Caves? The significance in 1830 was that these were animals of a type that were totally unknown. And indeed, I think probably what the Europeans expected they would find here in Wellington when they heard there were bones would be elephants and tigers and yeah, sort of like things that you find in the rest of the world that had been, come, that had been made extinct in Australia, probably due to some catastrophe such as a flood, and then the kangaroos and things uh, simply were the remnants. But when they looked at these fossils, they discovered that they were not elephants or tigers or deer. In fact, they were marsupials, like the kangaroos and the koalas we have now, and indeed very similar. So the significance of the Wellington fossils in historical terms is that it was the first really good evidence that changes on Earth have taken place gradually. And in Australia, the animals we see now that are so different from the rest of the world are that way because they have evolved slowly from similar ancestors. How do you tell the age of the bones found? We don't have available the technology or the money to buy the technology to actually directly age bone. It's very difficult. What we can do relatively cheaply is determine the age of bits of carbon that are mixed in with the bone. So most of the dates we have from Wellington Caves are from carbon dating, which is well and good except for two things. One, you don't know that that piece of carbon washed in at the same time the bone did. And two, carbon dating is only good to about 50,000 years before present, and we're pretty sure we've got fossils here that go back to beyond two million. In that case, all we can do is make a guess by looking at the bones we have here and the type of animals and comparing them with fossil beds that are known somewhere else in the world. For example, we've got a bat here, some bat teeth from a, a rock, and the only relative, the only thing even remotely similar, lives in France, well, lived in France, about two million years ago, so we can approximate the date. Is there any difference or link between the differences of the bones of animals to the changes of climate? Well. There wouldn't be a difference in the bones themselves. The thing is that the bones, particularly the teeth, identify the animal. And we assume that animals of similar types live in the same climate and eat the same food as they do today. So as we see different bones at different levels, that indicates different animals. And if they are associated with a different climate, then we say, well, at that time, uh, there was uh, some sort of climatic change. 
Okay, how is it that bones are found in fragments in the Wellington Caves? Yes, well, they're certainly fragmented. This uh, bone, which I was showing you earlier, is very typical. In fact, this is rather good, really. Uh, many of them are even smaller fragments, a single tooth or a bit of a tooth. We don't have any complete skeletons. We don't even have a complete skull. They've all been washed into the caves by water action and tumbled so that they're smooth on the end by water action and deposited here. And we really don't know the mechanism for that. It would certainly have to take place sometime when there was an awful lot more water. You and I would probably be washed towards the Bell River at that very moment. Okay, thank you, Dr. Orgy, for your time. And thank you. Melissa, what did you find interesting about the week at Wellington Caves? Well, I personally like going down into the caves and doing the media thing. And I like talking about what we're doing and looking at the bone fossils. Okay, Ernie, how did you, how did you originally get involved with caves and landforms? Well, I got involved with caves in that I moved to Janalan in 1970 when I had a job there as a guide. And uh, over my time there as a guide, I had a, developed a great interest in caves and started crawling around holes and all that sort of thing, looking for more caves. But one of the things that uh, came to my attention is my lack of knowledge of knowing how caves were formed. So I started reading books and trying to talk to people and finding out how they're formed. And in reading a lot of the books and finding out how they're formed and things like that, it was started to notice that uh, everything wasn't right as the books described them. So there was a lot of other factors involved. And what did come to notice is that man had been around and modified the caves quite a lot. And that's why everything wasn't how it should have been in the books. And from that, I started to investigate or get interested in, not so much investigate, but interested in what we were doing to the caves. Why were they modified? And did we have gained anything by modification or had we lost anything by modification? And this got me really involved in caves and how we affected them and what it was all about. OK, are they important to us? They're very important to us. Uh, they've been regarded uh, as very important to the human being for a long time. Uh, as I stated the other day, there was a form of shelter in times of great need, such as glacial ages and things like that. They've been a place to, for man to practice art in, and in our times and recreation. And even right back to the Romans, they had recreation in caves and things like that. They had guides. People took them. And the Greeks, they had people taken through the caves by guides. And so they've been always important to us. And uh, the regard is so important that when Australia was being discovered and people like Mitchell were spreading around and finding caves, they wanted to protect them. And this comes onto the field I talk about, management, land management and things like that. Because they would see their entrance to the caves as you got there, they were going important and they would declare it a reserve for the protection. But that's where we made mistakes. They didn't realise how far from that end the cave ran underground and all the systems that apply to it run away from this area. And so we only manage cave entrances because we recognise they're important, but we didn't know enough about them to know how important and how they belong to the rest of the landscape. Besides making this video, students attending the camp produced an information worksheet to assist other schools visiting the caves as an excursion venue. The pressure's on today to get the pamphlets finished for printing up on the laser writer. Pamphlets will be distributed to all schools in the western region. Vicky, what exactly are you doing at the project week? Um, I'm printing up the work produced by the kids of this week on the laser rider. What And what sort of computer are you using? An Apple Macintosh. We've written about the clock museum, the bottle house, the wildlife and the craft shop and um, many other things you can do while you're at the caves. And we've just listed the caves and what they're famous for and just other information of what you can do and we've also given an activity for the younger people to do. I think we're creating an educational package that can be used both through schools and to the tourists and the visitors to the Wellington Caves and we'll be giving it a wide variety of information which will help them understand and also be able to picture and sort of visualise what actually has happened in the caves over the last what, hundreds of thousands of years. What have you enjoyed at the camp, Kelly? Uh, I really enjoyed going down the mines, especially the phosphate mine. Like, I don't know, it's just the size and that no one else has been down there before and experiencing bats and how everyone was so uptight about the bats. Fiona, what's the relevance of this week to you? 
Bob, I'm very interested in the concept of running special programs involving students in the development of educational materials, not only for the, for the output or you know the product, but also for the personal growth that those students um, receive due to being involved in a week like this. Also, uh, the Wellington Caves is a, a wonderful resource to this area, and I like promoting the resources around Dubbo uh, in addition to the, the Western Plains Zoo. And how have you found the, uh, the students involved in the, the resource kit, particularly the media unit, this week to work with? A delight, Bob. I've enjoyed working with the video group very much. We've had students who perhaps initially at the beginning of the week didn't realise they had a talent. Um, they didn't have, you know, perhaps they didn't realise they had a lot of media skills. However, the, by the end of the week they've certainly shown what natural talent they've had in front of the camera. Very much so. Well, streetscapes and caving don't appear to have a lot in common. However, Wellington Shire Council is hoping to make them the focal point of the town's tourism strategy. Wellington Shire Council is looking at a main street study and developing the potential of the Wellington Caves to make tourism a more important industry in the town. The council, along with the help of the business community, wants to develop a streetscape which will attract visitors because it capitalises on the historic buildings which line the main street. We're looking at heritage values. Uh, we're trying to uh, reconstruct the street, uh, get rid of some of the additional signage uh, or the unnecessary signage, uh, accentuate heritage aspects of the architecture. The Wellington Caves have been identified by Council as their number one tourist attraction. Although several caves are already open for inspection, there's a suggestion to redevelop this former phosphate mine on the cave site and open it up for public inspection. We'd like to develop it as really an educational facility to educate the public a bit of our history of the, the Wellington area because it's quite an integral part of the area. And a lot of people who live in the town and live in the town for quite a long time just don't realise that there is a mine here or what, what its purpose was. The mine was in operation during World War I and although at that time was in operation for its phosphate, it also has an abundant supply of fossilised bone fragments which are important historically. The bones go back to uh, the Pliocene period and uh, there are remains of animals that were in this area thousands of years ago. But, uh, Thomas Mitchell found a lot of bones in this, this region here right back in 1830 and uh, took quite a long time before they worked out what these bones belonged to. Okay, so I'll just get here. I'll lower that tank down if you just take up the screen. Okay, okay that's it. Swing it out. have witnessed what you're about to see. It is McCavity, Wellington's mystery cave. For centuries concealed, now McCavity's treasures are revealed. So Simon, what drives a person to go cave diving? Oh, curiosity mostly. Mm -hmm. We were invited out here originally a couple of years ago to look at this little tiny hole full of water at the bottom of this cave. We didn't really expect that it would go anywhere spectacular, but we were proved wrong. Will I follow you, Simon? Yeah. Keep going. Just step across on the little hole there.
I'm doing here is putting this, which is our spare air, down the hole here. There isn't really room to uh, get down the hole with your scuba tank on, so we have a long hose, about 30 feet of it, with a tank just here. And uh, this enables us to get down the hole in that water there, breathing from this. And then once we're below, just this little squeeze here, uh, the tanks are passed down and we can put them on underwater and relinquish the uh, spare air for the next person. Uh, when the water is lower, this is much easier, but I don't know if you can see today, the water is right up, so it's going to be a pretty tight little squeeze. Simon. I'll need to uh, have you pass me my camera. Uh, I'll do just like we said, I'll go in, pass me the tank, little hand will come back up, grab the camera, that'll be me, probably. Okay, move. See you on the other side. drag some mud with you as you go into the cave. And the first time we dived it, we couldn't see really what we were doing. We both got in the water just near the entrance and said, okay, let's go, let's go explore the cave. However, once you swim maybe oh, only a couple of yards, that water clears to crystal clear water and you can see at least 100 feet. Uh, well, we think 100 feet. We haven't got a light powerful enough to penetrate more than 100 feet, but a lot of distance. The water's not cold here. It's about 19 degrees, which is unlike some other caves that we dive in. It's just stunning. Formations don't occur in caves that are flooded, they occur only in dry caves and they're formed by the dripping of water and the crystallisation of limestone, that's where stalactites and stalagmites come from. So obviously with this cave something has happened, something unusual has happened to the water table. The cave has formed, the formations are there and the water for some reason has risen again, maybe as much as a hundred feet. So this is a unique opportunity to go and look at a beautiful cave. Most cave diving caves are not beautiful, they're exciting, they're dangerous, they're cold, they're wet, but really beautiful. This one is visually stunning. It's got some of the best formations I've ever seen and you can swim around them, which makes it fantastic. some bats in one of the airspaces, about 100 metres into the cave, it's possible to swim up into, a, into an airspace, like a little lake, in fact it's very pretty. And on the first dive we saw a couple of bats in there, and in fact if you look carefully on the bottom there's little drops of, of, uh, of bat droppings on the bottom, so they obviously can get in there through some little hole that we can't find. Um, 
there is the skeleton of some sort of small marsupial uh, right in the back of the cave, maybe 200, 300 metres from the entrance. So it must have probably got washed there, I'd say, in a flood. Maybe the first time it flooded, who knows? respect it can be extremely dangerous yes, yes uh, if you have the right equipment and the right safety knowledge uh, it's fine um, for an inexperienced diver to come in he would be like holding a gun to his head there's no surface to go to so if you were to run out of air in there through carelessness or lack of planning you'd drown um, if you had equipment failure in there and you didn't have a backup system again you'd drown there's no there's no surface to run to you have to find your way back to the entrance and be able to repeat that complicated process of escape you need the correct mental attitude. It's something that has to be done very logically. If you're the sort of person who gets excited when you're stressed, cave diving's not for you. I guess it's a bit like tightrope walking. You mustn't get too excited. And a lot of preparation, a lot of experience. first dive and then as we went back we found more and more and more again. I think as far as this particular cave is concerned uh, we found all the major passages. However in a cave not far from here we found water again at the same level and another little hole and we're hoping to get through there and maybe we'll find the same thing again. Mm -hmm. 